Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Western Avenue Baptist Church. Let me go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings upon us. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to gather together as we lead up to Christmas. And Father, I pray that, uh, that you would uh, bless all those who are here, all those who are online with the teaching uh, of your word through our brother Terry, as we learn more about your son, Jesus Christ, through the book of Mark. And Father, we give thanks to you and pray that your name would be glorified through this, and we lift these things up in his name. Amen. Well, it's December 21st, the saddest day of the year. It's the winter solstice. Tomorrow the days start getting longer, which means summer's right around the corner. You're not a <laughs> Okay, well, we are in Mark chapter 10. We have completed um, up through verse 12 or 16, one of those two, I think. So let's uh, go back a little bit and uh, get some review. At the beginning of chapter 10, he and his disciples leave Capernaum and they go down south to Judea and then across to the east of the Jordan River. And the crowds are gathering around them as usual and he's teaching them. Matthew adds that he was healing them. We have a, a test in verse two, the Pharisees came to test him to try to find something they could hold against him. Um, they ask him kind of a trick question about the law they ask him whether it's lawful for a man to divorce a wife. And as we discussed last week, they really should know the answer to this. They were the experts of the law. If anybody knew the answer, they did. So clearly they were not asking him for information. They just wanted to see what he would say. So he takes them to the standard, verse 3, what, does, what did Moses command you? And then he takes them to a greater standard in uh, verse 7, excuse me, verse 6. Uh, that's God's plan from the beginning. The fact that Moses incorporated a permission to divorce doesn't mean that that's the way God wanted it. Marriage is permanent. We talked about uh, the difference between Matthew's account and Mark's account and uh, Matthew includes uh, this question of whether it's lawful for a man to divorce a wife. Um, they include the phrase, for any reason, because there were two schools of thought. Some said you could divorce for any reason at all. Others said no, only for immorality. And Mark doesn't include that. And we discussed last time that because the writers are writing for a purpose that uh, they're not going to say everything exactly the way it was. They're going to pick and choose uh, what suits their purposes. And that got me thinking this last week, what are the purposes here? Why is it that Matthew would include that idea of a justifiable reason for divorce, but Mark wouldn't? <coughs> it kind of hit me that Matthew is writing to Jews. And this was a controversy in Israel. So they would be interested to find out where Jesus came down on that issue, which side of the issue he took. Of course, he kind of made it broader than that. He wasn't taking sides. He just said, this is what God has said. Okay. Mark, on the other hand, is writing to Romans. They don't care about a Jewish controversy. <laughs> Why would they care? They needed to know about the permanence of marriage. In their culture, I guess it was not that permanent. 
So uh, Mark doesn't include that, but has a different focus. <coughs> Excuse me. So that brings us to verse 13. Did we talk about this one last time? Blessing the children. Seems familiar. Yeah, okay. So he, he uh, the people start bringing children to him to bless. The disciples say, no, don't do that. He's busy enough. And he rebukes the disciples for their rebuke. And um, says in verse 14, uh, you know, don't hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these and he explains that in verse 15 truly I say to you whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all we saw earlier in chapter 9 that the disciples are were arguing about who was greater in the kingdom which of them was the greatest and uh, that's not an attitude of humility you know children have an attitude of humility they, they well I suppose you could say most of them. <laughs> They're always exceptions. <laughs> um, but they'll believe anything, you know. It, it, it's unfortunate. That's why you have to be careful about, you know, what you say around kids. <clears throat> but he's using the children as, a, as an example of humility. You have to enter the kingdom with that attitude. If you don't have an attitude of humility, you're not going to get in at all, which means the disciples are in a pretty tight spot because they weren't exhibiting humility. I've got to take a sidestep here for a minute, do a little bit of English grammar. It says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. The word like is not the right word in English. In Greek, it's the word host, which means as, and it should be as in English. What it's really saying is, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a child receives the kingdom of God. As is used for comparing verbs, or actions, states of being, and like is used to compare things. So if you use like here, it's really comparing a child to the kingdom. But the child, the child is not like the kingdom. The kingdom is not like a child. So it should be as. We'll see that same issue come up later in another verse here, except they got it right that time. <clears throat> so the point is, you need to receive the kingdom as a child would receive it in humility. Or you can't get in at all. You can't go in on your own merits. So he's talking here then about kingdom priorities, verses 13 to 31, and those two priorities are humility and faith. He uses children here as an example of a reminder of the need for humility, and he, he brought that up as we saw in chapter 9. He set a child in front of them when they were arguing about who's greatest. He said, you really should be thinking about how you can serve each other. You need to have a servant's heart. That's what counts. And so he uses a child again to illustrate that. I also put up there Matthew 5.5 5, because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus dealt with this issue as well. That's the verse that says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. I think in the Jewish context, in the Old Covenant context of Matthew, uh, instead of saying the earth, it should say the land. The word there is eretz, it means earth or it means land. But what's the issue? If you go back to Deuteronomy, you know, God said, as long as you do what I tell you to do and don't do what I tell you not to do, I'll make sure that you can live securely and profitably, prosperously, in the land that I'm giving you to possess. But if you mess up, you're out of there. Because you know, if you ignore God and start doing your own thing, then you can't be in my land. So blessed are the meek. They are the humble ones. They are the ones who are going to obey God's word. And therefore, they are the ones who are going to inherit the promised land. Because they're 
obeying God. They're not rebelling. I think it's the same idea here. The next illustration he gives, starting at verse 17, is the rich young ruler. It says in verse 17, is as he was setting out on a journey, setting out from where? From east of the Jordan, and he's headed to Jerusalem. So he's just hitting the road, and this guy comes up and asks him, you know, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Mark, again, doesn't give us a lot of detail about travel time and ministry time and all of that because he doesn't care about that. All he cares about is that Jesus got it done. Very efficient. So the time between leaving uh, Capernaum in verse 1 of chapter 10 and then in going south and leaving east of Jordan going toward Jerusalem is about six months. Not a short period of time. He doesn't deal a lot, obviously, with what Jesus was doing there, but enough to give us the idea that he's still ministering, he's still accomplishing, he's still getting things done. We need to talk a little bit about this guy. The title of this section in the New American Standard is The Rich Young Ruler. I think that's also the heading for other English translations as well, and that's the way I have always heard it. But as I was reading through this the other day, I I realized Mark doesn't call him that. And I thought, why is it titled The Rich Young Ruler when Mark doesn't use those words? So I did some digging. I compared the the account in Matthew and and, uh, Luke and found out that none of them use all of these three words, rich young ruler, in reference to this guy. They use some, each one uses some, but they don't use all three. So to get this title, the rich young ruler, you have to put all of those three accounts together. And I I put together a chart illustrating this. Um, I didn't write it in a handout because it's not really essential to understanding the book of Mark. (laughs) But it it was a curiosity to me. (laughs) I figured I did some work on it. And anyway, this is, uh, yeah, the rich, yeah. There's a chart, if you can see it. We'll go through it anyway. Across the top, it has a title there, the rich young ruler. Down the left, you have the description, the three words, rich and young and ruler. And then you have the three accounts, Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 18. And I put in red there what these terms, or close to it. All three of them say that he was rich. In Matthew 19, verse 22, it says that he owned much property. In Mark 10, verse 22, it says that he owned much property. And in Luke 18, it says he was extremely rich, verse 23. So all three of them have the idea of being wealthy. So rich fits in all three. Matthew is the only one who calls him young. Chapter 19, verses 20 and 22. A young man came up to him. In verse 17 here in Mark, it says, A man... um, Matthew says a young man, and later on, verse 22, refers to him as young. The word young comes from the word for new, like new in time, new as opposed to old. It's kind of a general term. It doesn't give us a specific age, age group or age limit. Uh, But he was young. Now, doing a little bit of analytical thinking here, if he had a lot of property and was rich, then he had to be at least in his 20s, maybe 30s. He had to accumulate that. He, maybe he was a good businessman, okay, but still considered young. So Matthew's the only one who calls him young. Mark and, and Luke don't. And then the last word, ruler, uh, the only one who calls him a ruler is Luke. 
chapter 18, verse 18. <clears throat> Matthew just says one. In verse 17 here it says, and he was, as he was setting out, a man in Mark says a man. In Matthew it says one ran up to him. Some translations say someone. But it's not specific. So you get these three descriptions, but not all in the same place. And again, that's not a super deep spiritual thing. It's just a curiosity. I guess it does highlight uh, an aspect of Bible study, comparing texts you know, to one another to fill out the idea. So the point of the rich young ruler, as it says there above the chart on the screen, uh, was instruction of the need for faith. The children illustrated the need for humility, and the rich young ruler illustrates the need for faith. Uh, and we'll see how that works out as we go along. Different aspects here as we go, as we go by. Um, verse 17 again, as he was setting out on a journey, that's heading toward Jerusalem, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and began asking him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? We see some, some respect here for Jesus. He kneels down, calls him good teacher. That wasn't a usual greeting for a teacher. In fact, this is not the word rabbi, which is the way most people address him. This is the word teacher. <laughs> it's, in Greek, it's didak, excuse me, didaskalos. Didasko is to teach. We get our word didactic from it. Uh, so he calls him a teacher, a good teacher. So the first thing we see about him in his quest for eternal life is a sense of self-sufficiency because what does he say? What must I do to inherit eternal life? I've heard some people explain this, that you don't do anything to inherit anything. <laughs> You're in the will. You get whatever it is. You don't have to perform for it. Uh, but I don't think that's the emphasis here as we go through the passage. He's thinking about what he has to do. And this may be, as I put up there in the, the screen, a pharisaical focus on obedience. The Pharisee said, if you're going to please God, you have to keep the law right down to the smallest little bit. So he's thinking, what do I have to do? But it's, what do I do? If I'm going to please God, I have to do something. Jesus raises a question about his use of the word good, which is the word agathos, which in this case, the form of the word here means um, an inherent goodness, has to do with morality, ethics. And Jesus, Jesus says, what do you mean by good? Verse 18, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That's kind of a rhetorical question to get this guy to think. If you're calling me good, are you acknowledging that I am God? Apparently not. Jesus doesn't wait for an answer. He goes on to explain. But no, you notice in verse 20, the, the rich young ruler here doesn't call him good anymore. He calls him teacher, but not good. He just says, you know, after he said to him, or excuse me, and he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these. Why didn't he put good again? <laughs> maybe because Jesus just told him. <laughs> you know, if maybe he's thinking, I don't want to get, get, be criticized again. <laughs> okay. uh, maybe he's thinking, well, if he really means he's God, then I don't want to say that again. <laughs> you know, because he may have seen him as a teacher and not as God, which was not an unusual condition. We don't know. It doesn't say. He just didn't call him good again. <clears throat> so what does Jesus do? Verse 19, we have the authority here, uh, excuse me, the standard, verses 19 to 20, says, you know the commandments, 
he assumes that he does. At his age, he should, being raised in Israel, he should know the commandments. And he focuses on those commandments that are on the second page of the law, the second tablet of the law, dealing with how you relate to each other, how you relate to people. The first tablet of the law was all about how you relate to God. You'll have no other gods before me, make no graven images, all of that stuff. And then the second half of the law is about how you relate to other people. So do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not uh, bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Notice he did the same thing here that he did with the Pharisees over in verse 3. They asked him, is it lawful? And what does he say in verse 3? What did Moses command? Takes him right to the source, you know, right to the standard. He does the same thing here. The guy wants to know, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, well, what are the commandments? This is Old Covenant, Mosaic Law. You do what the law says. That's what gets you in good standing with God. <clears throat> so how does he respond to that? Verse 20, and he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. So basically he's saying, I've done all that. Now what? <laughs> I'm sure he's not being arrogant here. <laughs> he's being factual. You know, okay, you're saying I need to keep all these commandments and I'll have eternal life, but I've already done that. There has to be more. What else can I do? When it says, I've kept all these things from my youth up, we already noted he's a young man. What he's probably referencing here is his bar mitzvah. The ceremony, when a child reaches 12 years old, he goes through the ceremony in the synagogue, and he is, from that point on, considered an adult. And he is now responsible to God for how he keeps the law. So he's saying, I've done all of that since I was bar mitzvah. <laughs> bar mitzvah means son of the covenant. Bar is an Aramaic word for son, and mitzvah is a covenant. So it's the old covenant, the law, the Mosaic law. So he's now a son of the covenant. And he says, I've kept all those commandments since then, from my youth, from my bar mitzvah, on up to my current age, which may give us a little bit more of an idea of his age. Maybe it's been 10 years, maybe 15 years. It kind of reminds me of what Paul says in Philippians 3 when he's rehearsing his progress in Judaism before um, he abandoned that. He said, as, as far as the law was concerned, I was perfect. <laughs> I had kept the law perfectly. This guy's saying the same thing. And Jesus does what he did to the Pharisees. Back in verse 6, what did he do? He took them to a greater standard. He introduces the current standard, the temporal standard, and then he gets them back to the original standard. <clears throat> verse 21 says, And looking at him, Jesus felt love for him. The word looking at there is an intensive form of the word to look. It means really to look into. It's like a penetrating gaze. <laughs> he looked right into the guy. It reminds me of Hebrews 4.12. Uh, the word of God is sharp, you know, double-edged sword, able to penetrate, to the, uh, able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So Jesus is evaluating this guy, and he felt love. That word love is agape, that self-sacrificing love that's concerned about the benefit of the other person. And so he sees that this, this guy is sincere. He's devout. If he's kept the law perfectly from his youth on up, you know, he's serious about this. He's not joking. He's not trying to test him as the Pharisees were. He really wants to know. What are the requirements for, for receiving eternal life? And so Jesus has love for him, his honesty, his sincerity. 
And he says to him, one thing you lack. The word lack there means to fall behind. He's basically saying, one thing you are not up to speed with is the need. He says, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. It's reliance on God instead of your own resources. That's the one thing he lacks. He's depending on his money. <laughs> he's wealthy. He's rich. And Jesus basically says, this is what's holding you back. Your wealth is holding you back. And he will go on to explain that to the disciples in a few verses here. But notice the parallel the guy asks, what, can, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And in his answer, in verse 21, Jesus says, you shall have treasure in heaven. So he parallels eternal life with treasure in heaven. Because eternal life is a greater treasure than physical wealth. Why do you want to depend on physical wealth when you can have eternal riches. It's uh, similar to what we were discussing the other day or in a previous chapter about uh, giving up your own interests and adopting God's interests because your own interests aren't going to get you anywhere. <laughs> Only by following God's interests will you have any benefit. It's the same idea. <clears throat> your physical wealth isn't going to help. So why did he tell him to do this? Well, again, it's to emphasize his need for faith in God rather than faith in himself. He's, he, he was probably a self-made man. He has all of his property. Luke says he was extremely rich. <laughs> so he probably got all that on his own. And now he thinks, okay, what do I do to inherit eternal life? I've done all this other stuff. Surely... If there's something else to do, I can do that too. I'm capable of doing that. So Jesus uses the poor because the poor are without resources and dependent on the grace of others. That's faith. You're, you're, it's like having a flat tire on the road and you find that your spare is also flat and you have no inflator, uh, and your cell phone battery's dead. <laughs> you know, you're at somebody's mercy, and hopefully somebody will come along to help. Because there's nothing you can do to fix it on your own. So that's the condition that the poor are in, and this rich young ruler, if he's going to get any benefit from God, has to be in the same position. He has to give up the wealth he needed to eliminate his earthly resources and depend on God's grace so he can gain eternal wealth. Now, this is not to say that it's wrong to have money. I've known people, you probably have too, who Christians Divide, 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 divide,
So those are kingdom priorities, humility and faith, the humility of a child and the faith of one who depends on God rather than on his own efforts. Any observations, comments about any of that? Same idea, yeah. He stored up all that wealth and he thinks he's got everything made. And Jesus says, you don't really understand your spiritual condition. <laughs> you're, no, you're in no spiritual shape. <laughs> you know, you're... I suppose you could say you're out of touch with reality, the way things really are. Yeah, it's the same idea. Yeah. He said the same thing to some of the churches in the book of Revelation. You think you're doing fine, but in reality... You know, you're bankrupt. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a good place to stop. We're entering another section here, verse 32, where Jesus gives his third uh, announcement of his coming death. And since this takes up a bit, we'll, we don't want to get started on it and have to stop. So we'll stop there for tonight. And next week, we're not going to be here, so it'll be two weeks. We'll pick up in Mark chapter 10, verse 32. Okay. All right, let's close in prayer. Again, Father, we thank you that you have provided all that we need. We pray that you'll open our eyes to our needs, not our desires, and enable us to trust you for those needs and uh, glorify you for the fulfillment. In Jesus' name, amen.